So hi, everybody. My name is Scott Rudder. I'm the president and founder of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association. Thank you for uh, being a little patient with us as we get work through some of our technical difficulties. Um, before we uh, get started with the program, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank Sprague Energy, New Jersey Cannabis Business Association's preferred energy provider, Financial Resources Federal Credit Union, Cureleaf, Burton Trent Public Affairs, HBK CPAs, Township Green Dispensary, Sachs LLP, Dutchie, Puffin, Canna Remedies, DM Labs, Fisher and Phillips LLP. So those are our sponsors. Thank you everybody for that. Um, we have with us today a, 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 an OG in the in the New Jersey cannabis legalization efforts, uh, a leader on the business side, a leader on the social justice, social equity side. Uh, he was he and I hung out a lot. Uh, back in the 2017, 2018 years, um, sure you know, as all been advocating for legalization and, and, and how we could do it in the right way. Um, he has an amazing background. McQuay Lon Joel is the CEO of, Lue, of Lon Joel Holding uh, Group. Uh, he is the Global Economic Development Executive Officer. Um, he is a Chief Economist for the Marcus Garvey Institute of Human Development and is the owner of Lon Joel Holdings and Enterprises prizes is the CEO man you have a lot of titles man is the <laughs> CEO of EBITDA uh, International and a managing partner of Ob Obsidian Elite Investment Association but Quay, please keep me from talking anymore how you doing man congratulations you made it <laughs> <laughs> thank you so many thank syllables you. in there too many syllables hello everyone saying? thank you thank you how are you so, so Lequay, where have you been doing? I haven't seen you in a few years. You're coming back in a whirlwind. So what's been going on in your world? Uh, well, back in, uh, well, you know, 2019, um, no, no, no shade on the government, but New Jersey State Legislature and so forth kind of fumbled the ball. Um, we had started Obsidian Elite Investment Association. We opened up our um, first acquisition company and began to raise funds. And there was no... There was no clear path to legalization at that time, and it didn't seem like um, we didn't know what was going to happen, actually. Uh, so we had to basically shut down um, and stop taking money because we had a three to five year maturity rate. So we definitely wouldn't have been able to keep our promises. Um, we shut down. Uh, I had some property in Africa that I had owned for the past 20 years. Um, I went back over to Senegal just to check on the land and to see whether or not I'd be able to get into maybe some hemp growth. Um, I was able to do so. Um, so I um, I kind of engaged in that. I created a bioextraction farm, which was Ibada International. Um, so we focus on um, hemp CBD distillate. Uh, we're able to ship from Senegal to the U.S. Uh, as hemp oil, just like China or any other any other nation, any other company. Um, we also learned that we would, we are in that climate, we're able to grow saffron. Uh, we have some local herbs that are very good for um, fighting colds flu, cough, and so right, forth right. that are already, you know, studied by the FDA. They just aren't really commercialized. Um, so we kind of took advantage of that. And um, we've been going well since um, 2018. Um, we are now um, in the process of building permanent structures on the site. Um, and during that period of time, um, I was able to, uh, you know, find my way into the Marcus Garvey Institute. For people who don't know, Marcus Mosiah Garvey is one of the founders of the Pan-Africanist movement. He is one of the um, proponents that helped to create um, the nation of Liberia and repatriation in Sierra Leone and repatriation of Africans who had been enslaved back to the African continent. Um, he had, he's the first one to develop a supply chain um, between the United States, Africa, and the Caribbean. It was called the Black Star Line. Um, ran into some troubles here in the United States, and he was then deported. Um, he ended up dying in Jamaica. Um, never made it to Africa. His son, one of his surviving sons, he's about 85, came over to Senegal and we met. I did a ceremony for him and that ended up, you know, providing me with the opportunity to go to South Africa uh, with a gentleman named Meredith Field. Um, and he is an advisor to the king of the Bakalakoi kingdom. That allowed me to go down there, present a deal, the same deal I presented to S uh, Senegal, which was a nationalized cannabis um, program. As an economist, I'm looking at things at the, the higher level macro. And um, I saw how much that cannabis could probably assist them in terms of the development of their GDP. Senegal is very close with France and there were some French people who were part of um, the committee for approval. 
they actually, you know, France is the largest, can not cannabis, but hemp producer in the EU. So obviously they don't want the Senegalese. I did not know that. Yeah. Oh. They are. They did not want Senegal to kind of, you know, take that step. And they basically pulled me aside and said, they're not ready for that yet in a very patronistic way. Um, so I um, went down to South Africa, did the deal with King Latita of the Bakalakoi kingdom. And I know people don't know who the Bakalakoi is. Everybody knows who Shaka Zulu is, the Zulu people. The, the Basutu people, which are part of the Bakalakoi, where do they come from? That's the mother tribe. And the Zulu are basically like the, the younger cousins of the Bakalakoi. They're the ones who actually provided with them the territory to move on Cape Town and so forth. So it's funny to hear a lot of the history, but we did a deal for um, 6,000 hectares of land, which is 24 square miles, 15,000 acres with uh, a caveat specifically with 2,500 acres specifically for cannabis development at every level of the uh, supply chain. So our goal now that we've come back to the States is really for our capital raised. Um, as you know, Obsidian Elite has a very unique uh, capital raise um, platform. We, we only raise money with our members. Our membership join Obsidian Elite to learn more about financial education and wealth development collectively and individually. A lot of companies focus on individual investment. We focus on collective investment. Uh, the African-American and Hispanic communities combined are about $2.2 trillion in spending power. Most of that doesn't get um, circulated throughout the community. It's, it stays in. So, for example, a dollar that's spent in the African-American community stays there. Uh, most studies say one and a half hours. Some people say 20 minutes um, because we don't own most of the stores and most of the products and services that we buy are with other communities. Um, I think one of the, the very harmful byproducts of um, Jim Crow um, integration and slavery is the disintegration of the sense of African or Black community in terms of um, self-governance and economics. So the fact that we don't necessarily get that as a part of our tradition in our households, being that the majority of our population is either working class or in the poverty class, we don't have an understanding of the, not, not just the arena that we're in, we don't understand the lead. So it's very important to have that initial step of education, and then now we can galvanize investment dollars. A lot of uh, the municipalities and programs nationwide all talk about, well, what are you going to do for social justice? We call it economic justice because socially we, we're, 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 we're equals. I don't see myself as separate from or different from in any way any other culture in America. I have the same rights and I'll fight for them just like anybody else would with the same understanding of the Constitution. I think where we're unequal is in terms of economics and economics besides most of the things that we do in terms of power. So you could say what you want, you might have the right argument and most of us during the, you know, the uh, period of time when we were championing legalization, you can remember that my, my um, comrades were talking about how many licenses can we get and did so on and so forth. So you're talking about how many players can we have on a team? Can we afford to pay for the team? Right on. Right. Where, where's the money coming from, right? So now they, they didn't listen because they were so gung-ho. I talked to so many leaders that they just wanted to rush, rush, rush to the, to the finish line. And they didn't understand that when you get past that finish line, there's no government money available to you. It's cannabis. And I, th and I so, think that's been the, the biggest challenge. I mean, you so you, you've been gone for a while. You come back. But, I, I, you know, back in the day when we were all talking about this, we thought that, you know, as long as I get a license, people are going to throw money at me. Um, but the that world, the expectation. you know, the world shifted. So there was that for a moment and not just in New Jersey, but in other states where, yeah, you got a license, man. Everybody's going to throw money at you. You're going to be successful. We're all going to be millionaires. The reality is it's a it's a business. It's a store. It's a cult. You know, whether I'm going to open up a bakery, whether I'm going to open up a tomato farm or whether I'm going to open up a liquor store. All these equivalencies match up with the with the cannabis industry, and if you don't have the ability to raise money for that, you know, for 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 a liquor store or a tomato farm, it's going to be that much harder for cannabis. And I think that was the big wake up call. So the economy changed, so inflation's gone up, interest rates have gone up, so things have shifted. So what do you think about? So you come back now. You now you we were just talking earlier. You come back. So what are you seeing now? <laughs> I see that I, I could buy two items from Wawa, and it's twenty dollars. The inflation is ridiculous right now. <laughs> but what I what I see right now is um, there are preponderance of people that are coming in, you know, directly at me like, I need money. I need money. Where are you at in the process? And some of them are finished with the entire process. And they don't have the money. And they're not like 
you know, nobody. These are people who could be celebrities and so forth. And I'm like, you couldn't raise the money. And I think that one of the things that was not done when both the regulations were created um, and the law was a, a, a fine, a, some sort of economic analysis, right? There were projections that were done, but yeah. I don't think anybody actually went through and, you know, pulled the engine apart and looked at this. If you do this, it's going to do this. I think it was just, this is how much we're going to get in tax dollars. They're going to make this. And it's just a new, a new bubble that they could create. And I, unfortunately, I don't think you can form, you can't, you can't blow up a balloon that already has a hole in it, right? You're, this is an emerging market. This right. is a market where it already existed. You didn't get rid of the, the, the legacy market. You just created a legal market. So now they're coexisting and one is more competitive than the other. Right. And then you're going to then try and attract people from the VC community, the private equity community, with people who have no idea of how to even do business with them. So let's just imagine you're going to take a, a, a kingpin, perhaps, whatever, somebody who got locked up. Now they're going to enter into the cannabis industry. They're going to go through the, the process. They pay whatever money they need to do. They got the licenses and they're going to sit down with somebody from the VC community. They're going to eat them alive. Yeah. They're going to eat them a lot. They have no idea what the terms are. They don't even understand the whole process of the money. It doesn't matter how intelligent you are. It's not a question of intelligence. It's a question of, of, of exposure. Like, if you haven't been in these conversations, you don't know what EBITDA is. You don't know what this is. You don't know what that is. You have to go through a study course just to figure out how to do this deal. You know, I have people say, what's a convertible note? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're, you're going to be running this company, right? And, and they just know how to grow. Or they just, you know, they sold, they know how to sell, they know retail. And in that case, they don't have someone like me, perhaps, you know, um, championing them or working with them to try and get them that money. Not that that's what we do currently, but I tried to head that off at the past back in 2018, 2019 to say, hey, we need to galvanize our communities. I talked to the representative from the city of Atlantic City, which I'm from. I have a meeting with him tomorrow. I said, you guys know that you guys could have got behind me back then different mayor at the time. We could have had 10,000 residents in the black and Hispanic community from Atlantic City all invest. It would have been $10 million or better. And we would own a piece of every single one of these licensees that are going to be setting up in Atlantic City. You wouldn't have to worry about whether they're going to do 2%, whether they're going to be 3% of net or whatever it may be, which is probably going to be a couple of hundred thousand dollars or maybe even less. This money would go directly from their businesses as dividends directly into the community in perpetuity. That would be the deal that I would strike. And and we would be better for it. I, I just think that our leadership across the board is doesn't have the proper vision. We're so in a matrix that we don't, we don't, we can't think outside the box to be able to win. And yeah. I'm telling you, in, in spite of, I'm sorry to say this, in spite of the conditions that you're telling me exist in the in the the state of New Jersey, cannabis is still a winning industry. I've I've been in the legacy market. Cannabis is not a losing enterprise. The demand is not going anywhere because the higher the stress goes, the more people are going to want to, you know, sample, use and so forth. Mm -hmm. And micro deals thing is the way to go. You know, it's it's funny because you're right. It, it is growing and it's growing. I think it's more of the exposure that's out there and people getting more comfortable ending the stigmas and ending the stereotypes that surrounds cannabis, recognizing that child down the street, the grandma over there. They're also cannabis consumers because they need it for medical purposes. And all of a sudden right. it opens up people's minds or eyes. And what you're doing in Africa with regard to just not hemp, just not cannabis, but the other herbs and other healthy medicines that are out there, you know, we've become so accustomed to just taking a pharmaceutical uh, generated pill to solve a problem. And then we learn that they don't actually solve problems and they have nasty side effects. And so I, I really do believe what you're doing out there is the future um, where we're going as, as a country and as just a society, people making healthier choices, get off the opioids, get off the alcohol. Uh, and making these healthier options available. Now that you said that, Scott, you'd be surprised at what we're able to do in a lab with other herbs as well as cannabis. Um, you know, there's just there's so many different biological um, laboratory processes to be able to produce products like our delivery system. You got shatter, you got um, shakes, you got you know flour. And I mean, all of it is still legacy centered. It hasn't yeah. really gone to you know, cannabis is part of the health and wellness industry. It's part of the bio. It's, it's part of the bio extraction industry, yep. and if you start to learn more about that, you you could have you could have a drop that just literally goes in the both eyes, and it, you're going to feel it in ten minutes. 
It might be five milligrams, 10 milligrams, depending on what you're going for. And if you already know, cannabis is very good for eye development. That's why they use it to fight glaucoma in the past. So I, I'm just saying there's so many uses for cannabis that we haven't explored. There's 400 plus cannabinoids. This industry is in its infancy in terms of where it can go. It's research and development where the investment needs to go. But in order to do that, you have to continue to have these businesses grow so that you can cultivate the uh, the community and kind of like get them kind of accustomed and, you know, get get rid of prohibition, What it, you know, in their mind. Right. Very difficult process, but it's, it has to be done. So let, let's go back to back to the community, because I think let's go back to New Jersey centric conversation here for a second, because that. You know, what happened, the reason why the law is the way it is, you know, is it's it's a law built on good intentions, I think, for the most part, right? So we looked at right. what happened in, in 2018 with with the, the limited license exposure. So had six licenses out there, 100 people competed for it. And only if you already had millions of dollars could you actually right. be competitive in that environment. They changed the rules a little bit in 2019. They created other a couple of other tiers, didn't have to be vertical. Um, if you could all of a sudden go for a dispensary manufacturing license uh, separately. Um, and again, limited license structure, uh, more lawsuits. So we created all these delays, all this consternation. Right. And we right. basically threw that that model out the door. Um, we decided, like, look, let's level the playing field so that, you know, a mom and pop entrepreneur can compete alongside a cure leaf. You know, so you need a limited amount of money just to get started, create a conditional licensing path so you don't have to have everything complete. You can still you know, get your SOPs together, submit all that stuff while you're still pursuing money, while you're still pursuing municipalities. And I think it be, what what the result was were thousands of applications. And and yeah. many of those applicants, to your point earlier, this, you know, you could be as smart as a whip, but if you don't have that experience, um, right. every great chef doesn't make doesn't make them a great restaurant owner. Um, and, and I think that's where people, we still need to help educate various communities to various people to get up and, and learn how to be a better operator. And maybe your first step is not to be an owner. Maybe your first step is to be a manager, learn the business side of it, go yeah. through those challenges, uh, instead of throwing your 401k and other savings into a dream, um, you know, how can we help form it? So what are your thoughts on, you know, this is where we are right now, right? So you, you're yeah. back, you've seen it. So this is where we are right now. What improvements can the state make? Not just the individual, but what improvements could a, the state make to help best position people for success? Okay. Um, there's a number of things that I think the state needs to do. <laughs> um, number one, I think they need to, this is going to sound real funny, but I'm serious. They need to hire me. They need to hire an economist. <laughs> they, they, need to, they need to have an economic review starting with the legislation, uh, moving further down into the regulations from a micro and a macro level to kind of understand and organize the industry better, um, to go with the, not not so much the, the complete free market, but it definitely needs to be a, a more comprehensive understanding of how supply and demand really works in the market. I think that we pursued a, um, a an attempt to be fair, with um, the social justice policies and so on and so forth. Um, you could, uh, If you watch what's going on in New York right now, they open themselves up to lawsuits like crazy just because of mis mis miscategorization in the law. Um, I think that the state of New Jersey now, uh, they need to do an assessment. I, I asked the basic question, do we have any idea what 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 what's our supply like? I really don't know. No one has been able to answer the question. How much cannabis is existing in the legal market right now? Right. And then measure that against the demand. And once you can see whether that that will tell you how much more growth you need in terms of um, operators. Right. You don't you don't have a bar in every corner in every community in the state of New Jersey. In some cities you do. Um, and then it, it may work in those cities. But, you know, where 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 is the dispensary in Bridgeton, for example? Population of 30,000. Is, is that enough to support an, a, a, a real standard? Dispensary, you no, know, that needs to be a countywide dispensary. So how many of those are you going to approve? We're going to have 10 in that area? Well, I can guarantee you that nine of those or eight of those are going to fail. Right? These, this is just common sense kind of thought process. But um, a, a bigger issue that I believe that I think is probably the greatest mistake was giving so much power to the municipalities. Um, the things that I've, now I may have been in Africa, but we've still had clients. We had six clients that we committed $3 million to here in the States. So I've been on calls with landlords, um, realtors, 
uh, uh, city council, uh, whatever cannabis community, whatever they created committee, this, this, and that, and the third. And I'm telling you, uh, I've seen blatant where I, I've seen a city council member vote on a an approval where they own a portion of the entity. Right. So if, if you know, it, it's a textbook definition of I I should recuse myself, but they didn't, and no one challenged it. This is I understand that someone did it, but no one challenged it, which means that everyone has the same mindset. Stop looking at cannabis as a cure all and money, 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 money. If you're in a leadership position, this is an industry that can benefit the state in many of the communities, but it's not a free for all. That's how we can mess it up. That's how you want to break it. And giving the municipality that much power with no oversight and no teeth was really given to the CRC. Like I don't, I don't think they have an enforcement arm at all. So it, it, it's like, okay, we're going to pretend like we have rules. We're going to say that these are the rules, but we're on the honor system, and we're not checking. So that means the media has to make enough, you know, stink about it, or someone like me has to say something about it, or you. Um, even though I've seen articles where they're talking about um, the downward spiral of the cannabis industry in New Jersey, yeah. I will reiterate. I will reiterate. Yeah. Um, I will use the street term. This is weed. There is no drug dealer. There is no person who sold this had has taken a loss. That's not how this product works. There is a constant demand, and it's replenishable. It's sustainable. What we need to do is organize the market better. So it's not that we're in a downward spiral or going to be. We do need to, you know, do a do an assessment. We need to we need to regroup, and you know, we need to provide as much insight as we can to the government to help them do that. Because at the end of the day, we want to be participants in this industry. We're going to make money from this industry, and we want to continue to do so. So we need to protect the ship that we're on. No, no, absolutely, and and being a marine, I know exactly what you mean. So. Uh... <laughs> My, my friend here is a, as a Marine Corps vet. Uh, uh, Marine Corps I, I'm a Hua and you're an Ura. I'm an Army vet. All right. All right. <laughs> so look, um, those are great ideas. One of the things we're having a conversation right now, the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association and other stakeholders are having with state leaders is what process, what can we learn from what we've just accomplished, what we've just done? Uh, some things went well, some things did not go well. Um, but there's an opportunity to learn and then provide, you know, some process improvements and some other things. That's where I really asked the question, because I, I see I just see people struggling right now. I see the the need for money seems to be the, the, the biggest issue, which is one of the reasons we were excited to have you here. Um, but I also, you know, the political acumen. Right. So so your ability to to, you know, for some people talking to a government official is very intimidating. Um, and, yeah. and every town is different. Uh, and every political dynamic is different in every town, right? So some towns you have a very powerful mayor. Sometimes that mayor is not all that powerful. In fact, what they are is, you know, the, the, the political leader, the Republican Party, the Democrat Party is really in charge, but not the mayor. So you have all these different dynamics. Any thoughts that you have? I mean, you you know, you've been crisscrossing the state of New Jersey for a long time. You've been crisscrossing different government entities in, in Africa yeah. uh, as well. What what skill sets? What advice would you give to so that they are? The folks that are talking to these elected leaders are presenting themselves and putting themselves the best best foot forward. Wow, that's a very big, that's a very broad question. Um, yeah, so, right. yeah, the the uh, you know, obviously, if you're going to deal with anyone, a politician, right? Politician, you know, you got you got the administrative group and you got the politician group. So the politician group, it's it's good to know them. It's good to you, you need to have good interpersonal skills to be able to kind of create a bond really quickly. They got short attention span and um, you can deal. You, you need to have that. You need to be a good communicator. You need to know your business plan and you need to know if someone says this, how does that affect your plan? Um, that's so that's that's you got to you got to be competent. If you're going to deal with people who are in administrative positions. What you need to understand, they're following a point by point, point by point, point by point. If you need some special consideration, good luck, you know, and a lot of people kind of feel like they do. Um, and they try and tell it, you know, they're coming at this in an innocent way. and They try and tell their life story and how they got to be where they are. And that's great. And I understand people who are. Um, what's the best way to say this? I understand that people who, are, who, who, who have a desire and, and a clean and clear heart of what they want to do and they're hopeful. But this is a this is a this is the real world scenario. Um, this is a, a big money industry, and many of the people who are functioning are sharks. So if you're going to deal with politicians, 
You need to know what your plan is. You need to know what you're doing. If you're going to deal with the administrators, the same thing. But when you're dealing with the politicians, you need to have a, a, someone who is a good face person, someone who has very good um, interpersonal skills and communication. Um, and hopefully you already have your real estate in place. Most likely you don't have your money in place, but the real estate is very key. Yeah, I agree. I think that's that's the biggest challenge is is, is um, how am I presenting myself both to investors and also the, the, the local elected officials, the local leadership. And it's all about knowing your customer. Right. So that's, you know, it's something that's been drilled into me for a long time in, in sales and marketing is who's your customer? Because your customer is always also going to be different. Yeah. And so, you know, you'll find that, you know, in a lot of municipalities, some of your top advocates are in the in law enforcement. The chief yeah. of police who's got a budget to manage um, his his officers, they need new radios, they need new vests, they need whatever. Um, and he's always trying to think about, you know, how I can raise more money, how I can do this. And, and, and cannabis is this amazing revenue stream that um that people can get a hold of the local municipalities and i think a lot of law enforcement so just talking to the group out here but when you're when you're looking at advocates people who can get you in there the township administrators are great and all that stuff but if you can get in with the chief of police you're going to have a, a much better chance scott I, I think there was a question about my education i went to um in the chat i went to uh richard stockton college which is now i'm um, stockton university um, study international economics. Um, after that, I went to Seton Hall Law, study international law. Um, I didn't become an attorney. I didn't go that route. I went to the Marine Corps. When I went to the Marine Corps, I was a uh, combat engineer OIC. Um, Scott, can tell you what that is. But my sure, my sure. specialty was I built cities. I built cities. I could blow them up. I could <laughs> all of the above. I've done. I'm a three time war vet. Uh, I fought in three conflicts on the continent um, in my earlier days. I'm 52 now. Uh, and then I became a, um, uh, a, a insurance uh, group health benefits professional when I came back to the States um, in my corporate years. I worked for a company called Benicard Services under Douglas Forrester. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then, I, you know, I, I kind of, that's when I, I left that company when he, he did his last run for governor, um, started my own consulting firm. That His company became my first client, and then I've been independent ever since then. Um, so most of the companies, everything that I've done are, has been underneath my consulting firm. Um, we've done okay. That's amazing. That's a great background, dude. And it's and it's well-rounded. And I think that gives you the opportunity to really speak from authority as you're talking to folks and giving some counsel and advice. Um, so what can you do for the average? Like, what, what can you do for the folks who are still struggling to raise money, raise capital, um, and get their, get their, make their dream come true? So... I, I, like I told you, I got bum rush. I got, eh, I need money. You know, like, what do you, you know, they saw the headlines of what we accomplished um, in South Africa. Um, the, the, the main thing that I can do for them is kind of help them with funds, right? I can either, we can provide them with some funding. I, I don't have anybody that we're doing 100% of their funding. Um, I kind of have to spread it out. Uh, we're looking at about 11 companies right now that we want to finance and somewhere to the tune of, where were we at? 15 mil, about 15 million in total. Um, and where's that money coming from? We have, so my model, we have what's called an accredited investor. And a lot of people don't know what that is, but those are people who are qualified to hear certain offers, certain bids, certain potential investments. The majority of America are not accredited investors, which makes this a very difficult process because beyond your friends and family, if you're a company and you need to get financing, you have to talk to a, a private equity person or a VC person. You can't go out. You can't take an ad out in the paper. You can't say, hey, I'm selling shares and anybody want to kind of like buy into my company. It's illegal. Right. So we found a way in order to um, satisfy and be in compliance with those rules and at the same time raise money from, you know, everyday members of our, of our association. In that in that respect, um, the companies that we will be financing, they will have a logo um, that's called um, the Garvey Elite logo. And what that's basically going to do is represent to our members and our community that these are the dispensaries you want to buy from. These are, if you're a dispensary, these are the companies that you want to do business with, et cetera, and kind of creating a block. Um, our goal, you know, without question, Scott, is to achieve 30% market share. And that's not a goal that's based. And when I say 30% market share, I'm not talking about obsidian elite. I'm talking 30% right, right. market share for the, the African-American Latino community. Um, I did the studies early on where, um, you know, 20% of every dollar that comes into the household as far as 
um, African Americans and Latinos in the state of New Jersey, it stems from actually the legacy market cannabis sales. And that's a large percentage. And I don't think a lot of people know that. And I did my I did basic economic analysis using the the the, the, uh, the statistics that are available from the government and from the state of New Jersey. And I'm telling you that if we get rid of the legacy market today and everything was the you know legal market with the current percentages that we have, you're looking at five thousand dollars left less in revenue for every African American and Latino home in the state of New Jersey. And I told that I said that to many of the uh, public officials. I had to do the same thing you just asked me about and see if they would listen to me. Um, not many did. Not many understood. Most of them don't have any kind of background in business or finance. Um, so it just out the window. So I said, let me go do this program. Uh, what I what I believe that we're able to accomplish for the community is to not only raise capital from our community, which is considerable because it doesn't take a lot of people for us to reach large numbers. And we would be able to support many of the owner operators that are out there. Uh, I do have a lot of companies that are Caucasian owned or so forth. And they have basically come to me and said they want money as well. I don't have the viewpoint that a black owned company is literally just black owned because they're the owner of the company is black. If we invest in your company, you're a black owned company at that point <laughs> because your revenue is coming back to our community. It's not, it's not a question of race, so to speak. It's a question of culture and community. And not any, there's not a single community in the United States that can exist without recirculation of dollars. The, 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 you, if you have an impoverished community in the country, it hurts everyone. So everyone kind of has to have the same understanding that you know circulation of dollars creates wealth, right? So we're we're playing against every other country on the, on the planet. We shouldn't be playing against each other. And you know members of our society have not figured that out yet because they like exclusivity. But I think the more that we work together and we make sure that all of our communities prosper, the better off the entire nation. So I think that our model is the model to move forward, not just with this industry, but many other industries as well. That's very powerful, dude. Very powerful. Um, well, this has been fantastic. I think we got a little bit past our half hour mark. Obviously, we always have a nice yeah. conversation when you and I get together. Um, I'm going to thank our sponsors in a, in a, well, let me thank our sponsors right now, and then we'll come back to the point one second. But I do want to, again, we can't do this by ourselves. It really does take a team effort, and our sponsors are very valuable. So come check out our websites. But our sponsors for Lunch and Learn are Sprague Energy, preferred energy pro provider for the New Jersey Canada Business Association, Financial Resources Federal Credit Union, Cureleaf, Burton Trent Public Affairs, HBK, CPAs, Township Green Dispensary, Sachs LLP, Dutchie, Puffin, Canna Remedies, DM Labs LLC, and uh, you got rid of the last one before I could look at it. And uh, and also, everybody, we have to get to our event on December 6th. Um, it's at uh, Galloping Hill uh, Golf Club in Kennelsworth. That's where we have most of our events. Uh, it's free for our members. It's $50 for our future members. And we are encouraging uh, donations that will be going to a local food bank. Um, and again, that's on December 6th. So, the Quay, the floor is yours. What's your takeaway? What's your go away? What's your go away statement? So thank you, Scott. Thank you, um, New Jersey Canada Business Association. You've been there from the beginning, so I, I respect you and I, I, I value you as a colleague. If anyone is interested in um, making money with us, not just getting money from us, but also making money with us, you can join Obsidian Elite Investment Association. It's free. ObsidianElite.org. Uh, we have a wealth academy that you can learn more about financial education, financial freedom, and wealth development. You can also become a prime member, which allows you to be able to uh, purchase uh, units in Emerald Elite Acquisition, which is our acquisition company, the one that's investing in all of these industries. And you can make right now our portfolio is doing about 535 percent ROI um, with the deal that we just did in South Africa. I think that takes us somewhere to about 650 percent ROI. Our asset base has increased by 20,000 percent. And that's no lie. That's literally that's factual. That's crazy. Prove it. So. Um, I think that we had the correct vision and now it's time for everyone to enjoy the feast with us. So if you would like to be a member, just join us at obsidianelite.org. Thank you very much. No, oh, that's amazing. Laquay, thank you, sir. I appreciate you very you. much. Appreciate all that you're doing. Uh, and thank you all, all, everybody for joining our Lunch and Learn and have a, have a wonderful weekend and a very happy Thanksgiving. And we'll be seeing you on December 6th. Talk soon. All right.